Hello, wow, praise the Lord. Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of surprised I'm here because I just came from the airport. Yeah, and hadn't planned to do it that way. But we came this way instead of this way. And um, I left this morning at 3.30 in the morning from Albania. And we flew to Rome, Italy. Then we flew to Paris. And then we flew here. And so uh, it was a long trip. But we had a great weekend in Albania with the Albanian believers and uh, the church there through the weekend. And then before that, we were in Turkey. And, um, you know, just great stories of people that have come to Christ and gone through real difficult times. And, uh, and just the spirit moving, like in Turkey, with these, uh, you know, we had a conference of about 110 people came, you know, which was uh, from, they were from um, Uzbekistan and Russia, a couple of Finns, Hungarians, Turkmen, Iraqi, Iranians. One Iranian guy from the far side of Iran near the Afghan border like he drove nine hours to Tehran, and then he flew from Tehran to Istanbul to meet us. Yeah, because he had see he watches the uh, services on the internet, and he wanted to meet us. And he's a friend of El Shan, Pastor El Shan. And I mean, we had we you know God gave wisdom, God gave words. We had you know time, great time. We're just very encouraged. And um, some Iranian refugees, there was a baptism that Pastor Ismo did in an Armenian church that Niazi, Pastor Niazi had organized. And uh, that was a very big event because here we are in an Islamic country and water baptism is like really forbidden. But there, you know, there it was. And... Uh, it was very encouraging. People had a lot of joy and a lot of excitement there. And what you learn in Bible school, like it's so awesome because it comes back to you and you just appreciate it and think about it and see how important it is to other people that are so excited about learning these things. And there was a man from Cyprus who came and he said, you mean that we died with Jesus, you know, we, we said yes, and, and then, like, you mean, like, we're a family, and we're, you know, yes, and he was just so excited about things that he was learning, and it just, uh, you know, resonates with you that, you know, what you are learning, and what you are thinking, and how valuable it is to many people. Um, you know, also tragedy, like in that part of the world, there's civil war and there's uh, persecution and so on. So we were exposed to that, too. And uh, then we saw the healing, you know, of God's love in people's lives. So thanks for your prayers. Glad you're here tonight. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Mark, for that. You know, uh, like what he was saying about uh, praying without ceasing. Well, the portion I'm doing tonight is eschatology. We're going to do end times. Um, but just before we start up, uh, the, por the part that he was saying, wasn't that amazing about the mind? Like he, he wants to be aware of like how his mind um, is being used and being sharpened, right? You know, in the Scripture, a lot of times uh, men of God were attacked, not necessarily right, like, directly, but over time, right? And to go back uh, a couple classes ago with Samson, with Delilah, it wasn't it that she was after him every day, right? And then his, his soul got weary, and because of that, he eventually snapped. A lot of times in our Christian walk, it isn't, something that takes us out like just one day, but maybe it's over a period of time. 
And so, like what Paul says to Timothy, that, you know, a man that is a soldier of God doesn't entangle himself with the things of the world so that he can be well-pleasing to the one who's called him. Right? I think it's 2 Timothy 2.4. So, to be have a sharp mind is like so important. And the phrase that he used was pray without ceasing, right? And we can take that term and maybe we take the term and we think of it in a legalistic way. Like I have to pray without ceasing. Like I got to pray. But Charles Spurgeon said, what the law demands, the gospel will produce in me. So whatever the law in the sense, because the law is righteous, like praying without ceasing is a righteous thing. But if I try to do it in my flesh, it becomes something that I do out of the law. So <clears throat> it should be something that just comes naturally to me that I want to do. And how does that happen? But it's the gospel working in me. Or this new life that is in me. And I think um, when you become sp a spiritual person, like he said, like maybe somebody you see as hyper-spiritual because they don't do certain things that maybe you feel like you have the liberty to do. Maybe that's because they have a spiritual mind and they know they can't be involved in those certain things because it's going to take them out. Most of the boundaries that we have in life are to protect us so that we can be spiritually minded and sharp, right? Because our calling is like so important, right? Like our calling is so important. So I want to be a person that's sharp in my mind do I do this? Maybe it's not necessarily a bad thing, but in Hebrews, I think it's Hebrews 10, like he said, maybe it's not bad, but is it expedient? Meaning, like, is it useful, right? Like, is this going to help me in my calling or in my walk with, with God? And I'm not doing that because of legalism, because it's going to make me more righteous. It's more that I just want to be a sharp, sharp believer, right? That was good. What he, I mean, that was like, that was spot on. Okay, um, I don't know how long this is going to take. It's 7.47 right now. I don't know how long this is going to take. So we'll go through the material and have a great time. And if we're done 20 minutes early, we're done 20 minutes early. This is the last class, right? Is this finals week or is it next week? Next week's finals week. Okay. Um, all right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you. Uh, Thank you for bringing our pastor back tonight and Pastor TJ and for their time in Turkey, um, in Albania. And we just thank you for bringing uh, them back safely. And uh, we thank you for Pastor Mark and his life and just really how his life speaks. And min he ministered to us tonight with wisdom. And uh, just bless these, uh, these words, eschatology, the study of the end times. And really just uh, bring these things uh, clear, make them clear to us tonight, and anoint it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Um, who here has a pretty good grasp on uh, end times, or the, the timeline of, of end times? I mean, pretty good. You kind of feel like, am I going to? People are gonna think I'm proud or something for raising my raising my hand. I kind of know. So what I want to do tonight is I want to go over a brief. We're gonna use um, a few different prophetic scriptures uh, to show you. I'm gonna try and attempt to use this iPad and uh, draw a timeline. Uh, but we're gonna use Daniel chapter nine, and we can turn there. Um, we can turn there now, and then. Um, We'll look at Matthew uh, 24. If you go to Daniel chapter 9, verse uh, 25. And then we'll look at a few different uh, points about what Christ said about um, his, of the rapture and then also the second coming. Uh, so Daniel uh, chapter 9. I'm going to draw, try to draw a straight line here. Kind of, kind of straight. Um, the 70 weeks, are people familiar with that? This is intro to theology, so we're going, we're going into it. Um, 
um, introduction. Let's read uh, chapter 9, verse uh, 25. So Daniel, a prophet, speaking of the future. Now therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until, until Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street, so we can just do this here, so we can... It says that there's uh, 69 weeks. We'll put them together. 69 weeks that this speaks of. Uh, there shall be seven, seven weeks, 62 weeks, so 69 weeks. The, the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. So um, we have at the beginning here, so it starts off um, with the restoring and the building of the temple, right? And where do we see that happen? Uh, the Jews were... Uh, taken out, and they went to Babylon, and then uh, they came back. Ezra and Nehemiah, they came back to rebuild the temple. So from that point, this period of time, which is 69 weeks. Now the translation of the weeks is that one week, which is seven days, each day is considered one year. So one week is actually seven years, right? So we see that from the start to the completion of the temple right here is a seven-week process, which is 49 years, right? And we can see in uh, Nehemiah chapter 3 and chapter 6 that this period of time, the first uh, seven weeks, um, is from the, the building of the start and the completion of the temple. That remaining 62 weeks is prophetic to the time of the Messiah. Right? Christ coming in His crucifixion. So this gives us this time frame here gives us from Daniel chapter 9, 25, it gives us 69 weeks. Now if you take, if you take that period of time in history, which is, the beginning is 440 B.C. If you take that date all the way to this point, you get exactly the time that Christ was crucified. Because it says in verse 26, and after the 62 weeks, you have to see that the first portion of that was the rebuilding of the temple, which is the seven week. And then from that point to the time of Christ is 62. So in, in verse 26, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Then after that, we see in verse, the continuation of verse 66, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, which happened in A.D. 70, was the destruction of the temple. Now is the temple that is in Jerusalem, is it there this today? It is not, right? It was destroyed um, in 70 A.D. Now we still have one week left, right? We have one week to make up the 70, 70 weeks. And we see in verse 27, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, 
but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So the question is, when is this one week period of time? Is the tribulation period. So you had from the return to Jerusalem to the building of the temple, from the temple to the coming of Christ and the crucifixion of Christ, 69 weeks. One week still remaining. So the period of time between the cross and the tribulation, that's not counted in the prophecy. But after the rapture, because we believe in pre-tribulation rapture, meaning that we're taken out before the tribulation happens, there isn't that week. But after the rapture, this one week period of time, um, it starts up again. Uh, And it says that, let's look at it in verse 27. Let's read it again. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. So this is speaking of a of a man uh, who apparently has the ability to make a covenant uh, with the Jewish people. But in the middle of the week, so what would be the middle of the week if one year, if one day is considered one year? Three and a half, right? So three and a half years into it, He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall shall be one who makes desolate. So he it seems that he makes a he makes a uh, treaty or a peace treaty with the children of Israel. The first three and a half years, the Jewish people think that he is uh, their savior, and then the last three and a half years, he does something where it's the uh, abomination, and some scholars believe that at that period of time, and we do, we do believe this, that the temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem, there will be animal sacrifice once again, and that this leader, or this Antichrist, will come in and establish uh, a law so that the Jews are able to practice Old Testament uh, religion and ceremony, and there'll be animal sacrifice, and they'll everybody will be happy. And at the end of that period of time, he comes in and he does something uh, that is an abomination. And some people believe he comes in and he sacrifices a pig, or I don't, I don't honestly, personally, I don't know, but he does something that basically is making the point that he wasn't who he said he was. And um, after that point, the last three and a half years uh, is really all out. Um, It's just not good. It's all out war, right? So uh, you have this 70, you have this 70 weeks, right? There it is. Um, so we take that we take that um, literally, right? And the amazing thing is, if you do take those, maybe that's a study that you can do on your own. We don't have time to do it now, but if you can take those dates and you take the sixty-nine weeks and the start to the finish, and you'll get the exact time frame of when Christ. Uh, was crucified. That's pretty amazing. Okay. Is there any questions on that? Or it's pretty self-explanatory. I think that was. It's pretty simple. Um, okay. Now, uh, Daniel chapter two. Daniel chapter 2, verse 37. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, who is the the ruler at the time over the Jewish people, he has a dream. And in that dream, 
uh, he has this vision. And Daniel is the one who's able to explain the dream uh, to Nebuchadnezzar. And we have to take this from the start that Daniel is explaining this dream. Uh, he's explaining this dream. Verse 37. And he's speaking of the present, and he's also speaking of the future. So, um, verse 37, You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Speaking of uh, Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar and his power. And whereas the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them, you are this head of gold. So Nebuchadnezzar had this, here we go, we're going to attempt this. Nebuchadnezzar had this, this dream where he saw, he saw this man standing. These are his detached arms. It's just easier that way if he's detached. All right. Detached legs and then feet. So this man, he sees this, this figure, and um, th he each point, if we go through it, you can read it. It's from uh, verse 37 all the way down uh, to verse 45. And he sees this, and these are different empires throughout human history. It's hard to write with this thing. The head is a gold, and that's the Babylonian Empire. And then you had the Persian Empire, which were the arms. Persian. And then you had the Roman Empire, which were the legs. And then the, the feet, which... Uh, and each part of these are all different materials. Like the, bat, the head is uh, made of gold. Uh, the Persian uh, is made of silver. The body, I forgot this one here. This is the Greek Empire. Uh, the Greek Empire made of bronze. And then the Roman Empire made of iron. And then the feet, uh, which are, is iron also, but iron and clay. Not as strong as iron, but it's a mixture of iron, iron and clay. And this is, this is the revived uh, Roman Empire. And, and this is made up of ten kings. And you can say, well, when did that happen? Because we see that the Babylonian Empire, then the Persians, and then the Greeks came in and, and uh, destroyed the Persians, and then the Romans came in and took power over the Greeks. And now you have this time that there's this Roman or uh, renewed or revived Roman Empire, which is today. And there is this um, whole idea of who these ten kings are and how are they made up. Some people say it's the European Union or whatever it is. We don't know, but it's going to be a government that's ruling. It's going to be a one world government, a ruling government over the world. Uh, that will be led by these these ten bodies, um, and then the last one that we see in Daniel uh, two forty four is and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Right, so 
the last kingdom, the fifth, uh, the fifth kingdom, the last kingdom is God's kingdom that will come. And so we can see that throughout human history from the book of Daniel with the prophecy of, because at this time these other great uh, empires hadn't come, but Daniel's saying that these empires will come and then the last one will be God's uh, kingdom, right? And that's what we're waiting for, right? Okay. You got that? You guys are doing good. Is it hot in here? I'm hot. Okay. Yes. Yeah, no, it is today. I mean, that's like the Roman Empire has fallen, right? Um, now this new empire, which is the next one, which is the revived, like it's the feet, it's the revived Roman Empire. And so I guess there's questions in the sense of like what that body is, but from the picture that we see that these Babylon, the Persian, the Greeks, these were uh, empires, obviously not wrapping around the whole globe, but at the time were world empires. United Nations. Yeah, yeah, we don't know. I mean, I've I've read a number of different things, and I don't honestly, I I can't say that I necessarily have an opinion on it. Right now, you have the um, Illuminati, which is like the, the secret organization of the world that's built up. You know, it's been famous for you know for years. As far as the Bilderbergers and the, you know, the IMF. And Bank is all, you know, they're, they're all part of sort of these groups. And it's a very small group, but they they control the monetary policy of the world, and it's a, it's a very secret group. But um, their a lot of their theologies and a lot of their philosophies are you know, put forth to implement the world court system and all. So there is a group, you know, and it's a very secret group, but it's very the most powerful people in the world. Yeah. And it's you know, very, very, very interesting. Yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing is, like, uh, the whole idea of, like, this next government, the feet, we can say, is, like, we can, we can see how the whole idea of having a one-world government is definitely something that a lot of nations are interested in. And if you look, Revelation uh, 13, verse 7, And this is this is speaking of this is speaking of uh, the beast. Uh, verse seven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him of every tribe, tongue, and nation. So it it seems that. They do have. They do have governance over every nation, right? So there, so there's some way that all the nations are going to come together in some sort of league or whatever it is, and there there will be a person that's overseeing it and have power over it, and they'll have power over all nations, right? Um, let's look at uh. Let's look at um, the whole idea of the rapture, right? Um, if we look, let me see, where should we start? Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 24 first. All right, Matthew 24. You guys following this with me? All right, so you got the 70 weeks, you got the Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel's interpretation of the dream. And then we have uh, Christ in Matthew 24 speaking of, 
speaking of uh, the end times and, and um, what we will see. One of the amazing things um, about the end times is if you can look at the Jewish nation, right? The Jewish nation is uh, such, a, such an important um, thing to look at because did Abraham receive a promise from uh, God back in Genesis chapter 15? He did, right? And that he would make him a great nation. And out of that nation, it would, there would be, they would have it eternally, right? So um, we see that the Jewish people, um, they were out of their country for, uh, for what would it be, 1,900 years or 1,800 years, right? And then World War II happened, right? Hitler destroyed, I killed 6 million Jews, right? And then in 1948, the Jews come back uh, to Israel, right? And they get their land back. And their, the Hebrew tongue, because you have to think that at that time, you had all different types of Jewish people, right? You had Russian Jews, German Jews. Uh, you had American Jews. You had Jewish people in Peru. There's Jewish people in Peru, right? Which you wouldn't think, but there is. So they were speaking the, the tongue of that nation, right? But then 1948 came, and it was like a revival in, in the Jewish people around the world that they wanted to go back to Israel. And when they went back, they wanted to bring back the tongue uh, that they spoke. And so that came back. And since 1948 to today, they want to bring back the temple also, which hasn't happened yet, but it's in the works to happen. Um, which would be an amazing thing. Uh, that's a big one. That's a big one. Why is that a big one? Because if the tribulation period is going to happen, three and a half years into it, we see that the temple is going to be there. And if it's not there today, uh, then that's something that we're waiting for, right, with the anticipation that when we see that happening, and it's in the works. I don't know enough about it, Pastor Ben, who lives in uh, Jerusalem with his wife, who's a missionary from a greater grace missionary, lives there. Uh, I've heard you hear different things over time. The cornerstone to the building has been cut. So that could be in place. And they say once uh, they have the right to be able to build the temple, it wouldn't take that long to be able to do it. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the rapture couldn't happen today because the temple isn't built because we only see the temple come into play three and a half years into it, right? Um, so the question is, let's go over these. You guys are doing great. We're almost done. Uh, let's, um, let's look at a few different uh, th uh, things that um, have to come to pass for the rapture, right? To occur, the word rapture doesn't actually it isn't in the in the Bible. The word is harpazo, which it means to be snatched up, but translated into Latin is where we get that word rapture from, right? Because you can get people and they're like, "Oh, show me where rapture is in the Bible," but it actually isn't. It's the word caught up, right? Um, so a few different things that we can look at. How do we know uh, Daniel chapter? Uh, 12, Daniel chapter 12, increase of knowledge um, is one of, is one of the uh, prophecies, Jan Daniel chapter 12 verse 4, prophecy, this is another chapter of, of prophecy of the end times. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Right? So this whole idea of knowledge increasing and the ability to go to and fro. I remember one time I was sitting in an airport in Germany uh, coming back from a conference in Budapest, and I was just thinking that 
wow, isn't it amazing that we have airplanes today that um, we're able to fly from Europe to the U.S.? People, you know, maybe some of you in here have worked, and you work, you get on a plane at BWI, you fly to Ohio, and then fly back in the same day. Like, I did that a few weeks ago for work. I went to Ohio, and I was back at my house by 6 o'clock at night. Like, like, I mean, a hundred years ago, that wasn't possible, right? To go to Europe would take, like, months. But now it's we're to and fro, and then the knowledge that we have is is we're increasing in knowledge. And, and that's not necessarily, like, a bad thing, right? But that's just the... T- uh, a prophecy of the, the times, right? Um, Matthew chapter 24. Uh, verse 4, 24-4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Right? There's a guy down in, uh, there's a guy down in, I think, Georgia, and he's saying that he is Christ, he's Jesus. Or no, I'm sorry, Miami, Georgia. Do you know this guy? Maybe, possibly. Now, yeah, you gotta, you gotta find him. He's saying that he is uh, the Messiah, or he is Christ, and he has a, he's a Puerto Rican guy. Yeah, do you know this guy? Yeah, and there's another guy in Russia, like in in like far, I don't know if in Siberia, maybe he wears like long robe and he's got the long hair and he's got the eyes and he kind of just walks around robotic. And he also says he's like the incarnate Christ, right? Um those are like extreme, but then you have like offshoots uh with with uh, Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses and Catholicism, and Catholicism is interesting because, uh, in a sense, like why do you think Catholicism was is in Italy, right, in Rome, right? But like, where was Paul? Where was Peter? Where were they preaching? Where was the ch- the the church? Some of the churches, but it was in that part of the world, right? But over time, it can be perverted, and it becomes legalistic. Like the same thing that Paul was trying to like tell the Galatians, like don't let your church go this direction because you have people deceiving you, is now you can see like the Greek Orthodox Church and like how religious it is, right? But can there be truth there? Absolutely. I think with Catholic people too, like is there truth there? Absolutely. But it can be distorted. And Christ is, Christ is Jesus is saying in the end times there's going to be a lot of people that are going to deceive, right? Um, so that's one uh, one sign. First Timothy chapter four. First Timothy chapter four. Uh, verse four. Uh, or chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, that's I find that interesting because there is a new wave in the Western world for spiritualism, right? Spiritual life. Like Eastern religions. Oprah Winfrey, no. Right? I mean, there's this whole whole push right for the soul nurturing the soul you are a mini god or or uh meditation like my uncle my uncle is a big ceo he makes a lot of money and he's into like this whole idea of meditation um and there's an i this idea of spiritual life and they're doing studies now in meditation that actually meditation is like there's such a positive effect on your brain from people that actually meditate right? Um, Which is true, right? And a lot of times they take parts of the truth and then distort it. And so it's never Christ, but it's uh, some other form of spiritual, spiritual life, right? And we can, we can, uh, 
We just have to be discerning, right? Even preaching or preachers can be preaching a message, but does it have, a, have the right sound to it, right? And be careful maybe what you read. I mean, um, a lot of, I, don't, I like to read a lot of different things, but at the same time, the more I'm starting to read different things, the more I realize it's a waste of time. And um, a lot of it is self-help, and a lot of it is bettering yourself, and it's not Christ, right? And it's not necessarily beneficial. And a lot of uh, the messages uh, that you can hear from from even pastors and preachers can be a lot of self-help and this kind of idea, but it's not Christ, right? And so uh, Paul is saying to Timothy that, In the last days, there's going to be deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. What's the best lie that you can make up? It's about that far away from the truth, right? Like the best lie that the devil can make is to get that close to the truth, and it's not truth, right? So be discerning, right? What you listen to, like what Pastor Mark said tonight, right? It's not legalistic, it's just wisdom, right? I used to be like, don't tell me what I can read and what I can't read. I can handle it. But then all of a sudden I have like some strange thinking, right? Like I'm like quoting something that's like so far off, right? It sounds good, but it's not truth, right? Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So we have the rise of this whole spiritual idea. Uh, we have false Christs and prophets in Matthew chapter 25. And then in First uh, Thessalonians uh, chapter 5. Bless you. Gesundheit. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Um, this is the day of the Lord. Concerning, verse 1, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they, they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Right? So, peace and safety, peace and safety. And that's a big push, right? We want to have like a one world government with this message of peace and that you also have safety in it, right? Economically, and you'll have security, and they'll say peace and safety. And that's what the world is trying to push is this whole idea of having peace, but they can't get it, right? Um, so that's another. Another thing is is that uh, mockers, like it says in the last days that there'll be people that will mock and say, They've been saying that Christ is going to come for 2,000 years. Where is he? Right? Like if you think of Noah, like Noah was for years building the ark and they just mocked him, mocked him, mocked him. And he just did the will of God. And then it says that Noah and his family got in the boat, in the ark, and the Lord shut the door. And as soon as the rain came, then people started pounding on the door, but the, Lord, the, the door was shut, right? So it's like today we are like modern day Noah's, like preaching in a land that's like, you know, sinful and wicked and evil. It's a world system. And we're saying to people like the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming. Um, or there's the other parable that Christ talks about, the ten virgins, right? There's ten virgins. Five of them have oil, five of them don't, right? And the master comes back and they're not prepared. And they say, give me your oil. And they say we're unable to do it, right? So that's like a, an attitude uh, that the world has. They just make it a joke, right, that Christ is coming back. But if he said it, he's going to do it, right? Uh, Matthew chapter 24, Christians being martyred uh, for their faith. If you look, uh, Matthew 24, verse 9 and 10, then... Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Now you you can think of uh, uh, people being martyred. Obviously it it happened uh, at the beginning of the church and it's also happening today. Um, 
It happens in places, North Korea, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, India, Nigeria, Egypt. There's a Voice of the Martyrs, right, is an organization. And you can go on their website and you can, you can look and there's news about Christians worldwide. And we, we're so, like in the Western world, and I don't necessarily think it's like our fault, but we're somewhat detached from what's going on. Um, in the other parts of the world where people are really believers uh, in Christ in really hostile places and they sacrifice their lives, right? And that's a sign that that, that will increase as, as uh, time goes on, right? And we can be praying for them. No, I mean, it's amazing. You hear these stories of people and, uh, it, I mean, it brings tears to your eyes. Uh, Matthew 24, verse... Uh, 14, this is a big one. And it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So you have to think that 2,000 years from the time of Christ to today that this message has been preached, and now it's being preached all over the world, right? And we live in a day and age that we can have connections with people and people can get online. Like in Peru, I remember being in the middle of the jungle and like just thinking, wow, this is awesome. And then there's a guy on his Yahoo mail and I'm like, oh. I'm like, man, that's a bummer, man. Like you think you're like in this exotic place, right? And there's like people on ESPN.com and you're like, ah, oh, man. But it's like the day and age that we live in is, is that um, people are connected and they're able. It's amazing. It's a tool, right? People are able to uh, hear the gospel. Um, the next one is, you, you don't have to turn there, Zechariah chapter 12, uh, verse 2 and 3. Um, it says this, I will make Jerusalem and Judah like an intoxicating drink to all the nearby nations that send their armies armies to besiege Jerusalem. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone, a burden for the world. None of the nations who try to lift it will escape unscathed. So really, if you look at uh, world politics today and a lot of the turmoil that's going on, Jerusalem and Israel is the problem. And America has been standing by Israel. We have since 1948. And um, we're blessed because of it. Uh, but it's going to be a push that really people are going to start saying that Israel, Israel, that's the problem. If you get rid of them, then we don't have our problems, right? And that's a prophecy in, in uh, Zechariah. Um, the one world government, we said that in Revelation chapter 13, the rise of a global government. Um, and then in Matthew 24, uh, the signs of the end times, he he goes over uh, different things, and he says that there'll be wars and rumors of wars. And I looked, I looked this up. I don't know how accurate these numbers are, um, but this is what I, I... I'm sure they're somewhat accurate, but don't hold me to it. Uh, but the past 500 years have witnessed an increase in the frequency of wars. Um, 15th century, there's 29 wars. 16th, 59... 17th century, 75, 18th century, 69, 19th century, 294 wars, and the 20th century, 278 wars. Now, obviously, you have to think like all these increases are like famine and all these things are based on population, right? So, I mean, you're going to have a lot more people die from a famine when you have 7 billion people on the earth than if you have 1 billion. But that doesn't negate the fact that that's what the prophecy says, right? Um, famines in uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. Um, increase in famines. Uh, the 18th century, there was 28 famines. The 19th century, there was 30 famines. And in the 20th century, there's been 44 uh, famines. Um, they, this calculation has that the, during the Roman Empire there was 55, approximately 55 million people. Um, in the 20th century, uh, there has been 
55 million or close to that number that have actually died from a famine. And it has like the list of all the different uh, famines. Earthquakes. Christ says that there will be increase in earthquakes. In the 19th century, there was 29 earthquakes. In the 20th century, there's been 123 earthquakes. I don't know how accurate that is, but um, I know that it's been an increase, right? There's been a. Have you guys ever? Uh, have you read about the strange sound in the atmosphere? Has anybody heard that? No. Google it. You can Google it. Um, okay. In closing, the rapture. So all these are leading up to, these are all different signs. He says, just like a farmer looks in the sky to see what kind of weather is coming, so also do we look at the times and we can see, really, when Christ is coming back. And everything in prophecy that had to be fulfilled has been fulfilled to this point. Uh, so there's really nothing holding back the fact that Christ can come back today um, other than the temple, right? But that like we said earlier, isn't necessarily going to negate the fact that it can't happen today because that could happen in a short period of time. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Um, so this is speaking of not Christ coming back, like the second coming isn't the rapture, or that word harpazo, the snatching up. The rapture happens before the second coming, right? So we have, we can say, here's today. And we go, and then you have this catching up, right? And it says that it says that the dead in Christ shall rise. So um, we see that as not that the dead before us who have died are not in heaven. They are in heaven, but their body will be caught up. And they will be glorified. They will receive a new heavenly body, right? So this is the rapture, and then there is this seven-year period of time, Daniel's last, uh, Daniel's last week, right? And then at the end of the seven years is when Christ returns, right? So this is this is rapture, and in our ministry, um, we are. We are uh, pre-trib believers. And why are we? Can anybody answer that uh, question? What kind of doctrinal? That's correct. That is it. Right? Once saved, always saved. He hasn't appointed us to wrath, right? So we believe that if, if this is an outpouring, just like in the day of Noah, that the flood came, but Noah wasn't, in it, right? He was protected. So also will the believer be taken out when the judgment, because you have to know that this seven year period of time is a period of time that is really judgment. Just like Egypt received judgment, so also will the world uh, receive uh, judgment. And then we see in um, Matthew chapter, uh, you don't have to turn there, but uh, chapter 24, verse 27 to 31, the second coming of Christ, right? And that's when the believers, you and I, and the angels of heaven, we come back and there's this great battle um, of Armageddon, right? And it's an area up in the north of, of uh, Israel where there's this valley, and I, I've spoken to people that have been there before, and this valley is like, they say it's like an amazing, it's an interesting place because you can just kind of see how the whole thing can unfold. It's almost like a perfect valley for a huge battle, right? 
and um, Christ will be uh, victorious. We will be victorious, right? And then after this period of time, the devil is put away for a thousand years, right? And you have this millennial, you have this a thousand years. You have a thousand year millennial uh, reign. Okay, in, uh, let's see, the last verse, First Thessalonians, First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. It would be amazing that if this is the generation, right? This is the generation that is the generation uh, that is able to not die. Who in the Bible, who in the Bible didn't die? They never tasted death. Enoch and Elijah, right? Enoch, where's Enoch in the Bible? This section over here. Enoch in the Bible. In Genesis, right? He walked with the Lord how long? Three hundred and was it three hundred and sixty five years? Huh? And he was not. He just he was taken taken up, right? Uh, verse sixteen for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. That word I've I've heard uh I've heard teaching on it. Pastor Love actually taught harpazo, which means to rip out, and and he goes into that word, that Greek word, meaning that like there's people that will be believers that will be like so entrenched here on earth that they don't necessarily even want to go, but he rips them out. There'll be like there'll be some believers that are just ready, like the virgins with the oil. And then there'll be other believers that are here and they're entrenched. But like he takes them, he pulls them, he pulls them out. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we shall be with the Lord always. Isn't that good? It's amazing. Um, I think that's it. Does anybody have any uh, questions or comments or anything like that? No. So what should we do until that time comes? Like, what does the Bible tell us to do? Taking Bible college. <laughs> yeah, I had a list of. Um, we just do it off the cuff. What it, What does the Scripture say? Make disciples. Preach the gospel. Make disciples. Right? Gather gather together. Right? Pray without ceasing. And be ready. Right? So easy we can, like what Pastor Mark was saying, that uh, you can be, you, you're not sharp, right? And then all of a sudden you're not believing or you don't care. But I feel like if you're sharp spiritually and your mind is renewed, that you like see things around you. Because it's so easy to say like, oh, come on. That's just normal life. Right? You know that Winston Churchill, right? World War II, Winston Churchill, Adolf Hitler is in Germany, and everybody's saying, like, oh, he's just saying. He writes his book, right? And and people are just saying, like, oh, dude, he's just, you know, fanatical, but he's not actually going to do what he says. And then he actually ends up doing it. But there was a guy like uh, Winston Churchill that was able to stand up to it. And a lot of times we can be so caught up in the mainstream and we just go along with things thinking that that's the way it should be. But actually, like, sometimes you have to, like, call out and say, like, this is, like, this is not, this is not of God, or I have to be sharp to be able to be discerning. Because um, even, even with just sexuality in the country, like, it's amazing how it doesn't happen overnight, but over time, all of a sudden, you get used to um, certain things. 
and you think that that's normal all of a sudden. And then you start hearing, like, well, maybe it's not that big of a deal, right? And I know, like, in this country with homosexuality, like, it's not necessarily, like, homosexuality doesn't take people to hell, just like heterosexual people, like, having sex doesn't take them to heaven. Like, that doesn't take you to hell, just like having a normal relationship is not going to take you to heaven. But at the same time, the scripture says that in the last days, there's going to be unnatural affection. Right, And it very clearly stated in the Scripture that that is going to happen. And the world is like pressing on our door a lot, even the church. And it's a, like a very hot topic because in mainstream, it's all of a sudden, it's just the norm. Fifty years ago, like it wasn't the norm. Now it is the norm. And the church has to be very sharp in the sense of like, what does the Scripture say? Like it's like a homosexual person... They're unsaved, just like a good moral person is unsaved, right? Like, there's, there's no difference. They're both lost. But at the same time, I'm not going to say that that act, just like, you know, name it, greed. I mean, greed is a horrible sin. So is having unnatural affection, right? So we have to be sharp, like Pastor Mark said, because the next thing you know, we're like living in this Western world, and we're like falling asleep, just going along with the flow. Right, because you don't want to be an outcast. But doesn't it say the scripture says like if people come against you and they hate you, just know that they actually hate me first, right? And if I've had tribulation and trials, you also have tribulation and trials. So like the question is, when do I stand up and like say like this isn't the way that it should be, right? So that's what we're we're doing in Bible school, right? <laughs> we want to be sharp. We want to be sharp people. All right, we're going to end a little bit early. Hey, great semester. It was good being with you guys. Thank you for letting me be here and to, to be teaching, and it was a real pleasure, and it's a joy. So uh, good luck. Is there an exam next week? I'm assuming so. Pastor Simon isn't here. He's at home drilling out crazy questions. So let's just pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for, we thank you for these things, this study. Uh, that the end times, uh, we know that it's it's going to happen and that it's for sure because whatever you say is sure and that we want to be believers that are ready, watching, preaching the gospel, making disciples, not sleeping, not going along with the flow, but being people that are doctrinally sound, full of love, full of grace, full of mercy, and not judging people, but being a light in this world and bringing people into your banquet house, like you said. Go out into the streets and bring people into the banquet house, Father. And we just pray for people that we'll come across in the next few weeks that are lost and, and give us the courage, give us, fill us with the Spirit, give us the mind to be able to speak true words and speak encouraging words and and that we could lead someone to the Lord. What an amazing thing that is. To be a vessel of truth and to be able to lead people to you. That's amazing, Lord. And we just pray that this is such a great time of year that we're able to uh, do that. So, bless every person in here. Their walk with you. Their calling. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.